Apologies for the short delay. We had a couple of technical issues which are now sorted and uh, we've given chance for participants to join. So apologies for that short delay. Uh, good morning, everybody. And I want to say a big thank you to you all uh, for joining this uh, webinar this morning on the recovery of our machine tool uh, sector and particularly the effect of the machine tool uh, purchasing industries. Uh, my name is Marcus Burton and I'm the chairman of the Economic Committee uh, for SESIMO. Before we start the presentations, there's just one or two housekeeping rules uh, for the webinar. Please uh, keep your cameras off. Um, only the presenters will have their cameras on. Uh, and I'm sure you'll have questions, but the Zoom webinar facility, we're not using the microphone. That's not allowed. So could you please use the chat box, put your questions that you may have or any comments into the chat box. And if it's to a specific speaker in particular, note which uh, speaker the question's for, uh, uh, and our SESIMO team will monitor the chat and we'll deal with the uh, Q&A at the end of the meeting. So before I introduce the first speaker, I'll just say one or two uh, words. About SESIMO. And um, SESIMO is actually the, the representative of the machine tool sector across the whole of Europe, consisting of 15 national associations. And this represents about 20 billion euros of, of sales. And it's a really important sector because 75% of our production is exported. And it represents a third of the global production. So we're representing around 1,500 companies uh, who have about 150,000 employees. And 80% of those companies are actually small to medium enterprises, SMEs. And therefore we cover almost the whole of the metalworking machine tool uh, production in Europe. So today's uh, meeting, very important. I think it's going to be fascinating. We've got two speakers from the important sectors for our industry in terms of automotive and aerospace. We will start off with a summary of where we sit at the moment and the forecast for our industry by Anto Jerkovic, who is the uh, SESIMO's public affairs uh, economist. And then we'll move into our two industry speakers the first is Petra Dileski on the European automotive uh, industry, uh, followed by Mr. Jan Pai from the European aerospace and defence uh, industry. And I'm really looking forward to that. We've not only got the post-COVID response of our sectors, but also the global objective of tackling climate change and CO2 emissions. And I'm sure they'll have something to say about that. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, which is Mr. Anton Jerkovic from SESIMO. Thank you, Anto. Uh, thank you, Marcus, and uh, thank you all the participants uh, in this webinar, as well as uh, the speakers who are going to share their uh, views on their industry sectors uh, today. Uh, I'm going to prepare, I prepared some small overview about the European machine tool industry and about uh, general business climate uh, at the moment in the Europe. So I will start with the uh, figures about the latest uh, orders intake, and then I will say a little bit more about the general business climate that is related to the all industry sectors and uh, some uh, trade highlights about the machine tools and uh, business outlook or forecasts for uh, our industry. So uh, if we are uh, watching, uh, sorry, uh, if we are watching the machine tool orders, the latest figures for the second quarter of uh, this year, uh, we can see that uh, after a sharp improvement in the first quarter of this year, uh, the domestic uh, orders uh, index continues to grow, reaching 110 points in the second quarter. And this is the highest level since the first quarter uh, of 2019. And on the other hand, uh, if we are watching uh, foreign orders index after a significant increase uh, in the first quarter, uh, when 
the free region orders uh, reached the level of 105 index points. Uh, in the uh, second quarter, uh, we have uh, it's registered a slight decline during uh, the second quarter and is standing on uh, uh, 19 aim points. Uh, this decrease uh, is mainly related to the significant decrease in uh, Italian foreign uh, machine tool orders index, uh, which registered a decrease of 34% uh, uh, compared to the previous uh, quarter. Uh, but if we are watching at the same period in the last year, uh, what we can see in this uh, chart uh, above the in the table above the chart uh, that uh, domestic orders uh, increased for 136 percent and uh, for foreign orders for 107 uh, percent. After uh, similar to the previous uh, chart uh, after significant growth in the first quarter uh, due to decline in the foreign orders on the graph, uh, we can see a slight decrease in Sesimo 8 uh, total orders uh, as well. But uh, when we compare this to the level to the same period last year, it's still a significant improvement where uh, more than 112 uh, percent uh, increase is registered. Uh, even we can see a slow decline in the Sesimo 8 total uh, orders indicator as a result of a positive business climate and uh, recent forecast, uh, which we'll see later, we expect uh, that this decrease in the total orders uh, to be just uh, temporary. Concerning the general business climate in Europe, uh, we can see here one uh, indicator, uh, the business confidence indicator, which can be used to monitor uh, the output uh, growth and to anticipate turning points in the economic activity, uh, where the numbers above 100 suggest an increased confidence in the near future business and uh, numbers below 100 indicate pessimism towards the future performance. And we can see that uh, opening measures uh, are having an impact on Europe. So the business confidence uh, indicator rose to very high level uh, in the second quarter of uh, this year, reaching 102.2 uh, points. Uh, and that's the highest level since 2010. And moreover, the latest figures uh, of 102.7 uh, points uh, in August show that uh, it's clearly in the expansionary territory. And it's good input, of course, for the expected orders and the output in the third quarter of uh, this year. Uh, as we can see here, uh, all the European countries are in the expansion territory. Uh, and this uh, indicator, uh, as I mentioned before, is uh, recorded, recorded uh, uh, 102.7 uh, points for the uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, it's higher than it was the average in the previous uh, in the in the uh, second quarter, which is a good signal for the uh, third quarter of uh, this year. And we can see that almost all European countries are above the total uh, business confidence indicator, indicating in increased confidence uh, in the near future business performance for uh, Europe. Uh, if we are watching the European Union Industrial Production Index. Uh, uh, he maintained its level in the second quarter, uh, similar to the previous, uh, similar to the first quarter of this year, and it's uh, significantly above the baseline uh, 2015. So uh, industrial production index recovered by 4% uh, in the first quarter, in the last quarter of the past year, 1% in the first quarter of this year, and 0.1% uh, uh, in the second quarter of 2021. And that's the highest uh, quarter level since uh, third quarter of 2019. And uh, after the brilliant catch up uh, in the past uh, three to four quarters, the growth momentum uh, in the industrial production uh, reached a very, very high uh, level. Uh, if we are watching the capacity utilization figures uh, in the investment goods sector in the European Union, which is very important for our uh, sector, uh, after the highest level in the second quarter, we can see a small decline in the third quarter of uh, this year. Uh, but if we know that uh, between the 2011 till uh, 2019, the capacity utilization rate average was uh, 83.6. We can say that this indicator uh, reached its normal levels, standing at uh, 83.9 uh, in the third quarter of uh, this year. 
Uh, on the other side, if we are watching the EU production spear capacity, uh, he currently stands at 5%. Uh, and uh, compared to, to the previous quarter, it's a significant uh, decrease. And this would indicate that uh, manager considered that their production capacity could become insufficient and that in investment in equipment might be needed. And this should, of course, have a positive impact on the uh, future uh, order inflows of the machine tools, especially if the production spear capacity levels fell behind uh, these uh, levels. Uh, if we are watching the global uh, manufacturing uh, purchasing managers index, uh, uh, we can see that uh, the upturn in global manufacturing has lost uh, further momentum during the second quarter as uh, because of the rates of the output growth slowed down in the several major markets, including the United States and European area and slipped into the contraction in Asia. In any case, uh, after 56 points in May and 54.1 point in the August, uh, index is still in the expansion territory uh, or zone. And according to the latest press releases, uh, efforts to raise production further were constrained by uh, supply chain issues uh, and in some cases shortages of labor and uh, skills. Uh, and as we already said, and we can see here on the chart, there was a small decline uh, in the machine to total orders in the second quarter, which uh, in correlation with the global and eurozone manufacturing uh, purchasing managers uh, index. Uh, if we are watching the European countries, we can see that all the European countries are uh, in the uh, expansion zone and uh, significantly above the uh, 50 points, uh, which is uh, the step for the expansion or uh, downturn uh, zone. So even we have some small uh, decreases uh, in some European countries, they are still above these uh, 50 points. Uh, concerning the trade uh, of the machine tools and uh, SESIMO uh, total exports and imports, we have the latest figures from the International Trade Center for the first quarter of this year, and we can see uh, the increase uh, of the total exports for 17% and the uh, increase of total imports for 12% uh, in the first uh, quarter. And one of the main export markets are uh, further uh, United States and uh, China. Concerning the new orders uh, and the forecasts for the new orders, uh, According to HPO forecast, our partners, uh, the peak in the second half of this year got corrected downward at the 110 uh, index points in the latest forecast from this uh, September based on the uh, results of the uh, quarterly uh, orders intake in the second quarter. Uh, Oh, but uh, overall, demand is still expected to remain strong until the end of the year. As we could see on the previous slides, the business confidence index rose to very high levels in July, and it's clearly uh, in the expansionary territory in the third quarter. So the growth momentum uh, in the both in the industrial production and specifically in the German machinery sector has recently stabilized out uh, substantially at very high level. And uh, therefore, according to HPO, uh, they suggest that the decline in the new orders uh, is uh, likely to be only a temporary nature. And thanks to the strong demand, it's expected to grow uh, in the second half of the year. And however, as we can see in the chart, uh, in the next year, uh, according to HPO forecast, when the catch-up effect is exhausted, the curve points uh, to the down uh, downward again, uh, with the result that's expected uh, that new orders uh, for 2020 second year uh, falls back to the level seen in uh, 2019. Uh, here we can see uh, some uh, forecasts from April concerning the uh, machine tool consumption uh, from the Oxford economics. And if we are watching uh, their figures from the April in their baseline scenario where uh, world machine tool demand is expected to grow in this year for 15%, in the next year for 7.5%, and the 2023 uh, in 4.7%, and in 2024, uh, 3.4%. Uh, and we are the global machine tool uh, consumption should back to the 2019 levels in 
2023, uh, we can uh, say that uh, their scenario could be achievable because the world GDP uh, is uh, expected to grow by 6% uh, in this year. And that we can see also uh, on the International Monetary Fund uh, uh, results and the latest press releases uh, from the European Commission where uh, growth projections for the global economy is that uh, GDP is going to grow for about uh, 6%. Uh, and uh, when we are talking about the uh, global industry and uh, very important uh, machine tool purchasing sectors, uh, motor vehicle and aerospace, according to these forecasts from April, uh, we can see that uh, aerospace sector uh, is expected to grow uh, for output uh, for 11.3 percent in this year and the period when output returns to the uh, last quarter of the 2019 levels is the first quarter of 2023 and for the motor vehicle and parts we can see that expected uh, growth of the output in this year is significantly is significant 17.1 percent and uh, they should already return uh, to their output level such uh, they were uh, in the uh, pre-corona uh, virus uh, levels and i'm speaking here just about the global industry not just about the european this is uh, the figure these are the figures for the uh, global uh, manufacturing and of course i believe that the following speakers uh, are going to tell us a little bit more about uh, the uh, current situation in their uh, sectors and that should be all from my side i'm getting back to you marcus thank you anto for the uh, summary uh, certainly positive to see the bounce back and i can certainly comment as an industrialist uh, when faced with all the uncertainties we've had with uh, COVID, to see the bounce back that we've had in the economy has been uh, uh, very important. And some of the figures you've shown underline uh, that that should uh, continue a little bit uh, in the short term. Um, now we'll turn to some of the things that drive our business. We've got two important purchasing um, sectors for the machine tool industry. And I'd like to start um, by turning to automotive. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Mr. Peter Delecci, who is Director for Mobility and Sustainability Transport at ACEA, which is the European Automobile Manufacturers Association. So welcome, Peter, and I'll hand over to you to give us your thoughts on the outlook for the industry and its future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, I hope you hear me well. Uh, pleasure for me to, to be part of, of this webinar. And uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, and Anto as well, uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to give you some perspective about, about the future, uh, which definitely would be challenging. Uh, I don't want to say it will be pink, uh, definitely will be green, uh, but uh, we'll see what will be the implications uh, for, for our sector and, of course, for, for yours as well. Um, I, I'll try to, to, to structure uh, the presentation. I don't know whether uh, you, you are going to, to share the slides or uh, should I do that? Or uh, uh, what, what, what was the uh, setup? Uh, I think I mentioned in the email that it's uh, better if you can share your slides with us. But if you want, we can share, of course, the slides from the, our side. Okay, I, I will try my, my best. Um, Okay, uh, you see the screen and uh, the slides? Uh, not yet. Not yet. But we are still waiting uh, because there is a note that you started with, uh, sharing the screen. Okay, let's wait a second because uh, it's... Yeah, now it's fine. You just need to put in the full screen uh, mode. Okay, I hope now it's perfect for you.
If you could put it on a slideshow presentation, slide. that might help a little bit. Okay, go ahead. Full screen. Uh, That's fine. No. It's fine now. Okay. It's a good deal to carry open. Okay, so um, I hope it will work. Um, I, I think that uh, what I tried to, to give you was some. some and there are, there are a couple of critical issues uh, that uh, that are ahead of our sector. Uh, a short uh, short look on say uh, the COVID implications, which of course uh, has significant impact on, on our industry. Uh, but as in principle the past, uh, we have the future, uh, which is uh, in principle represented by by the Green Deal, uh, and uh, recently presented Fit for 55 package, uh, which was which was announced and presented by the Commission recently. And in principle, it leads to, to two uh, trends in our sector, which is a move towards the zero emission mobility and uh, a digital uh, mobility that, that will come in, in future. So those are the key elements uh, that I want to focus on and, and give you a couple of uh, thoughts, uh, what, what, what you can expect and, and, and where we stand. Um, with, with respect, let's say to 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 the look on the, on the past, I, I think that uh, I think to to every every industrial sector, uh, the the has has a huge or had a huge impact uh, on on our sector. I think everyone is familiar with the, with, with the falling number of registrations, uh, and uh, it means also a falling numbers of the production of the vehicles. Of course, there are a, a number of uh, recovery measures that were put uh, in place uh, on on a European and a national level. Uh, but of course, um, this is uh, this is probably not something that will that will last forever. And for us as automotive, uh, let's say that the driving uh, driving, let's say forces we are more not exactly what the consumers want to see, uh, but what the regulation uh, is demanding. Uh, and so this is especially um, let's say relevant for for the CO2 standards. Uh, of course, we are seeing. Uh, strengthening of the of the euro standard so euro standard is expected so to be presentation and that will drive us in into into a certain certain dimension uh, um of course for, for us it's uh it's a question uh how it is uh sustained from the second industry because uh, I mentioned a number of supportive measures uh, after after the call uh but of course that can uh, last not forever uh, of course the, the the pockets of the of, of the member states uh are are, are limited uh, and uh, we will see how the how the measures uh to let's say stimulate the demand uh, will last and of course uh, the, the second issue related to regulatory issues is of course how ready we are for 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 such a quick transformation of, of our industry and here we have enough open open issues uh, especially for example with respect to the infrastructure for alternative fuels uh, which means whether the, the consumers will be accepting uh, that transformation so quickly. Um, and so uh, we'll see what will be the final deals uh, under the Fit for 55 package because uh, uh, what I think is uh, uh, a proposal to the Commission, but the huge uncertainty what will be the final outcomes with respect uh, to the interinstitutional negotiations. So. Um, I think that uh, everyone is aware of, of, of the clear trends with, with respect uh, to, to e mobility. Uh, I hope that you can see see the figures. So, of course, uh, that there was a, a clear uh, clear return uh, back to to the figures that uh, we had before the crisis 2009. And once we reached that, uh, the, the COVID came uh, and it hit the industry enormously uh, with a huge of the registrations and production uh, altogether. It, it, it's uh, about roughly minus 24 uh, percent for the pre-COVID uh, situation. Um, and of course, uh, exactly at that time, uh, we, we are starting to have, uh, let's say, enforce the new targets for 2020. Uh, so uh, we were, let's say, stuck in between two, uh, two major trends, which is, uh, let's say, the, the huge drop in, uh, in, in registrations. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we need to switch uh, to uh, electrified vehicles and, and need to register them because, okay, uh, according to registrations, uh, we are, uh, let's say, uh, penalized if we are not meeting the, the, the 95 ground targets. So you see in, in, in 2020 a huge shift uh, towards, of course, firstly, uh, from, uh, from diesel to petrol. Uh, this has a uh, number of, of reasons. 
we are all aware of that, uh, but we did this share uh, declined enormously. We will see a huge, huge shift uh, towards uh, alternative fuels, uh, mostly represented uh, by the electric rechargeable vehicles, uh, meaning battery electric and plug-in hybrids, uh, and also hybrids uh, without, let's say, the, the, the plug uh, or connection uh, to the grid. Uh, those are representing uh, already, uh, let's say, uh, one, uh, one fifth of, uh, of the registrations. Uh, which is a huge uh, change, but of course, uh, again, going back to the sustainability issue, uh, of course, we, we need to do that because we need to fulfill the requirements of the regulation. On the other hand, of course, it's, it's still a question mark whether, whether this would be sustainable uh, for, for the future. This is especially, uh, let's say, relevant if, if we have a look a little bit deeper on, uh, on uh, let's say, the structure of, uh, of the market uptake of, of those alternative powered vehicles, uh, because in principle, the demand is, is driven uh, by just uh, a few, uh, a number of, uh, of member states. And so we have, unfortunately, uh, a vast number of member states that are really lagging behind. Uh, so so this, this, this clearly shows that there is a huge imbalance uh, with, with the, let's say, the, the uptake uh, of, the, of the cars for the future, which are driven by, of course, certain incentives. But uh, again, going back, we, we, we are not sure whether this will be sustainable for the future or, or not. Uh, uh, so, so uh, of course, I, I will share the slides uh, uh, later on, uh, so you have the figures where you can see uh, the huge uh, discrepancies uh, between between the member states. And that is something that, of course, if we, if we want to speak about uh, a mass market and something that uh, can be sustainable for the future in Europe, uh, this is not exactly what we want to see. Uh, um, I, I think uh, the, the critical point uh, for us, uh, so, so this was a picture of, of, the, of the past uh, and where we stand. Uh, of course, you are interested uh, in, in what is happening now and with respect to the future. And uh, for, for us, for our industry, it is clear that uh, it will be driven by, by the requirements that are related to the Green Deal package. Uh, you are aware of, uh, of the Fit for 55 package that was adopted by the Commission uh, in, in mid-July. And of course, it, it contributes, or, or let's say, splits the, the responsibilities to the member states on, on one side, but also uh, for, for the industry as well. Uh, and jointly, we, we, we should reach, uh, let's say, the minus 55 uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction uh, in, by, by 2030. Um, and of course, for, for the automotive, uh, it will really have a, a very huge, huge implications. Uh, it again, um, let's say, uh, strengthen the, the CO2 targets uh, for cars and vans. Uh, it, of course, uh, will and hopefully will strengthen the, the, the pressure for the member states to invest in, into uh, infrastructure for the uh, low and, and zero emission vehicles. You know well that we'll have a, a particular uh, ETS system uh, with respect to, to the transport and building, uh, which, of course, will, will probably drive uh, the, uh, the prices of, of carbon to probably unexpected uh, let's say levels uh, that of course should stimulate the consumers to move uh, towards the zero emission vehicles and so of course this will be also associated by, by a number of, of measures on, on a national level uh, like for example taxation etc so in, in brussels we call that the twin transformation uh, which means that we, we need to move into green and, uh, and and digital future and of course that that will not happen uh, within one day but uh, to be open uh, we have uh, we have ahead of us a decade uh, where we do expect a really massive transformation of, of, of our sector. I think if we if we focus on, on the green transformation, uh, there is a clear uh, clear push uh, for the electrification of the fleets. Uh, I'm stressing here we also uh, count on, on hydrogen as a, as a part of uh, of the solution. And uh, you know the, the the commission is is proposing in principle the the, the ban or or let's say the elimination of the combustion engines by 2035. This is something that, of course, is, is heavily discussed within, within the industry. And uh, for, for us, this is some kind of a night. I think no will happen tomorrow, uh, neither what could happen uh, in, in 40 years. Uh, but this is something that uh, definitely uh, will, will change dramatically uh, the, the sector. As I mentioned, we will see whether this will be really fixed at the end of the negotiations. Uh, I think from the perspective of the industry, uh, we definitely don't want to kill the combustion engines. Uh, let, let's put it very bluntly. I think that uh, we need to focus on the, on the issue, which is CO2 and, and not a tool, how to reduce them. So uh, this is something that definitely we will we'll discuss with the policy makers. But I think that the trend is clear 
and uh, I'm, I'm afraid that there will be a very serious discussions uh, on, on that file uh, in, in coming year, year or two. Um, and of course, I mentioned this is this is electrification, but also we see uh, that the hydrogen could play a very interesting role. Uh, of course, uh, I'm speaking here also on behalf of the of the commercial vehicle sector, uh, which is definitely uh, could or cannot be electrified uh, fully uh, by, by the time frame that is foreseen. And uh, hydrogen definitely will, will will play a role in in this green transformation. Um, also, there are a number of questions that, uh, to be open, we, we do not have replies to, uh, which, of course, is, this is this is especially the, the question of the infrastructure is available, because for, for, for the customer, this is essential that uh, you have a visible network and uh, you have a certainty that, that you can charge the vehicles. Again, a, a legislative proposal is on the table, uh, and we will see where, where we'll be in, in two years' time, but this is, uh, this is really, uh, let's say, a precondition uh, that if you want to move uh, towards immobility, uh, we need to think uh, about uh, the, the, let's say, the energy carriers uh, that that will supply. Um, this is of course valid for the passenger cars, uh, for heavy duty uh, transportation logistics. This is even more critical uh, because, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's it's clear that you you cannot charge uh, passenger cars in the same way like the heavy duties. So this is really a huge challenge uh, ahead of us. Uh, I think that uh, the, the open question that everyone has uh, is, is the question of the price, affordability of mobility. Definitely, we, from a perspective of, of the industry, we would like to keep uh, the mobility affordable. But of course, having in mind the investment needed, and uh, as I said, it's it's not only CO2. We, we have Euro 7, we, we have other standards. Uh, we are afraid that th this might be a question, uh, and also uh, having in mind the probably foreseen a uh, really sharp growth of the of the fuel prices, uh, this is something that is, is really worrying, and, and we will see how to how to tackle that, which is linked uh, in in general to, to the role of, uh, of renewable fuels, which, which is an open question. Let's be let's be very open. We are having uh, a lengthy discussions with our colleagues from the fuel sector, uh, and of course, there's a need uh, firstly to decarbonize the the current liquid fuels, but of course, there are alternatives for the future like e-fuels. Uh, but again, uh, we have a decade in principle to solve all the questions. Which is really something that uh, that is enormously challenging. Uh, affordability. This is something that really uh, is is a concern uh, for us. Uh, uh, we, again, sim similar, uh, let's say, to to the distribution uh, of the registrations across Europe. Uh, we we see that this is again clear split uh, in, in in Europe. We have huge differences uh, in between uh, north and south and east and west, uh, and in principle, uh, let's say two thirds of the registrations are concentrated uh, in, in, in just a few countries uh, across Europe. Uh, we did some kind of investigations uh, and, and our own studies. We, we see a clear correlation uh, be, between uh, between the, the G, GDP uh, per person income and the uptake of uh, electric charge of vehicles. And uh, you see that there are visibly uh, a clear split in, in Europe. And uh, if, if we talk about uh, uh, green, uh, bright future. I think it should not be only for a couple of countries, but uh, it, it should be an issue for for all the member states across Europe. Um, so, in principle, you see the the distribution uh, with, with with the highest uh, lowest uh, share of the electric vehicles. Again, clearly link uh, to to the wealth of, of countries, uh, but that is something we we have on and try to find uh, some. To make the distribution equal across the EU, and if to move to a, a kind of, uh, mobility in future, definitely it must be uh, valid for for all countries in in Europe. Um, this is also related to 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 the one of the key enabling uh, conditions, which is the infrastructure uh, which is lagging behind, and that will be one of the key priorities for, for our industry to focus on. Again, uh, we have in principle three countries uh, that are carrying one. Uh, Quarter one fifth of all the charging point, which is which is absolutely ridiculous, and the uh, enormous gaps be between the countries. But of course, without that, uh, I'm pretty sure we we, we cannot move uh, with with e mobility, uh, and so uh, this is a, a, a another uh, concern of, uh, of the industry. But uh, really, we need to uh, make the investment in the infrastructure in order to make the of of vehicles. Sustainable for the future. 
So that was, uh, let's say, the perspective of a, of, of a green uh, transformation. In parallel, uh, we have the digital one. Uh, this is something that uh, on one is probably not too visible, uh, but I think especially if you, uh, for, for you, it's absolutely critical. Uh, I, I think that the digitization of the track wall presents a huge opportunity. Uh, it is about uh, new business models, it is really about uh, new ways how to how to produce and sell uh, certain certain products. And for all of you, it really represents some kind of, uh, let's say, the future pillar of the, the transfer. Um, I think that uh, from the perspective of uh, OEM, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you are aware of, of the two uh, critical, uh, let's say, pathways. It's uh, the gravity on site and uh, move towards the autonomous uh, vehicles for the future. I would like to say that uh, to be open, uh, having in mind the, the green transformation, the green pillar, and most in that direction, because we'll be forced by the legislation to implement that green transformation as quickly as possible with an enormously short time frame. So, of course, uh, the digital part, I would like to say that will be somehow. Uh, will put uh, huge efforts in the in the green transformation or digital and of course uh, the digital transformation of the sector and and that's the projects for the future is not just a relying on on our side uh, th this is an issue that okay we have a counterpart which is, uh, which is infrastructure we are talking to our partners uh, respect uh, the uh, road break etc both connectivity as automation uh, of the business would require a huge, huge cooperation uh, between uh, between the network, the physical one, and of course uh, the upper layer, uh, which means uh, the networks uh, that are providing uh, IT solutions, cloud services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is something that will go uh, hand in hand. Uh, I think that uh, it's clear that uh, it will be more uh, a product. Let's put it like that. Uh, uh, time to time, I'm reading interesting articles that in principle in a car you have a multiplied uh, number of software equipment uh, than in a shuttle. Uh, this is correct, unfortunately. So I think that really the, the software development, software solutions will be something that will be absolutely dominant in, in the cars uh, for the future. And that will be also uh, in the chain. So, Peter, Peter, it's, if, it's my. It's Peter, it's Marcus Burton here. Can we can we wind up fairly quickly because we're running out of time? So do do appreciate exactly. that. Thank you. Exactly, exactly. I'm I'm just coming to the last line, which is summary. Uh, I think that you have seen that we have a huge huge uh, what is what is uh, really worrying is the timeline. It's it's a no sort in the next decade. Uh, we need to change not only the, let's say the production. Too much change, but it is the mass of the consumers. So how to behave, how to use how they operate the operator etc. It represents a number of opportunities, definitely, but still, there are a number of open questions that I do not have a list today. But that will be my opening for some kind of, I mean, and I can stop with that and leave it to the others. Thank you, Marcus. Peter, th thank you very much. Um, we had a number of problems with, with the sound at stage, or certainly I did anyway. Um, uh, obviously, the slides were very, very clear. Uh, uh, if there are any parts that people want to ask a question about, please think about that now when we can get those questions in the QA, and then we could ask Peter to give us a little bit more insight. The direction of travel is clear, a lot of uncertainty within the sector. Um, I'll move quickly on actually now to the other another important sector for the industry, which is the aerospace sector, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jan Pai. Uh, Jan is the Secretary General of the Aerospace and Defence Industries Association of Europe, and uh, we look forward to hearing about the perspective of the aerospace and defence industry. So I'll hand over to Jan. Thank you very much. So thank you, and uh, and thank you for inviting uh, ASD to present at this occasion. I will start sharing uh, the slides now. I see if can you see me, hear me uh, clearly. Yes, everything's yeah. fine. That's good. 
Excellent. So uh, I'll try to be quick. Um, problem now is I can't change the slides. Oh, OK, found the solution. I'll touch a few words about ASD on the impact uh, that we've seen from the COVID crisis, uh, the way forward, and uh, also uh, not just the European industry, but a few words on the global aeronautics priorities uh, as we speak today, what, what it all looks like. And part of it you've already heard, so I'd be very short on that. So I won't go into further on the Green Deal and the, uh, the, the Fit for 55, because it's the same for us as, as for the automotive industry. Uh, just so you know uh, about ASD, we do represent through different kinds of memberships, some 3,000 companies of all sizes from 18 European countries. And it is an advocacy, normal trade association. So advocacy is our key uh, workload, so to say, a key focus. And this is a, a map showing the membership. Uh, so the geographical footprint is quite big. You can see that we have direct company members because you have the logos at the bottom of the slide and you can see national associations on both sides of the map. Uh, so that's the construction of the association. Um, this is an industry uh, which had in 2019 a turnover of some 260 billion euros. Uh, and here you can see how that is divided into the civil aeronautics and also to the defense and space sectors. And many of the companies are obviously active in either two or all three of these sectors. So it's really um, a combined reason. There's a reason for why the aerospace and defense is in the same uh, trade association. Uh, the number of direct jobs created here is related to uh, then employees that do have a contract directly with the ASD members that we represent. So we're on top of, of the direct jobs, 892,000, there's a number of indirect jobs as you go down the supply chains. And there is no good estimation on that. We, we say uh, more than a million because uh, we, do, we can't keep track on it, but the commission in the ecosystem reports have identified 5 million or so. Uh, and uh, this is just uh, impossible to know uh, as the sub suppliers for the sector is extremely uh, huge. So where are we then? How did the COVID crisis uh, impact our industry? Uh, and this is a snapshot or a picture from Eurocontrol of the flights uh, over Europe. And the yellow uh, dotted line is indicating the number of flights. On the left, you can see the numbers. So you can see it. Uh, and, and on the bottom of the slide, you can see the date. So you can see on the 11th of March, 2020, um, and then the 25th of March, 2020, 20, and onwards. Here you can see, by the way, I think there's something wrong here because we didn't have uh, 25,000 flights on the 11th of March, 2020. Yes, we had, we had, sorry, we had. So this is, this is exactly when it started. Here you can see the immediate drop from 25,000 flights in the European airspace that goes down to practically zero. I mean, uh, we speak about a couple of thousand flights. So uh, on the global scale, almost 90% of the commercial aviation fleet was grounded overnight when all the containment measures started to take place in different countries. And then you can see uh, how that has developed until where we are today. This is a stretching until the 11th of August, 2021. You can see that, okay, there was a slight increase uh, coming up towards uh, last summer when we tried to, to reopen the airspace a bit, but then it, uh, new containment measures came into place again, and then it went back again. Now we are on the climb. Uh, towards what is normal, and the blue dotted line here is, is the normal uh, situation. This is what we would have expected. And here is my first key message that I think is important. I'd like to underline uh, for the aerospace, because these numbers are often referred to. For the aerospace industry, coming back to normal is not reaching 2019 levels again. So even if the yellow line would uh, sooner or later come up to the blue level, it's not a normal situation. What was behind the, uh, the, the uh, drive behind the aeronautical industry uh, in a pre-COVID scenario was the growth forecasts we had for two decades. So we saw 4 to 5% annual growth for decades to come uh, related to an increase of demand, related to a renewal of fleets, related to, uh, to climate change and, and uh, keeping the environmental footprint under control, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw airlines being wealthy enough to handle all of that uh, as customers to our sector. 
And if we come back to normal flight levels, but with hampered airlines, with scarce resources, uh, and with no growth forecast for the, for the sector as a whole, of course, there is uh, zero appetite or capability of replacing fleets or increasing fleets, etc. So it's really uh, a difference when we speak about a normal situation, what would the new normal be? But coming back to, to 2019 flight levels is not an indicator for that. So how did it affect our members? And because these are our customers on the previous slide. How did that affect our members? And here I took two examples from ASD members. And this is, you could probably guess, I didn't spell out the names, but it's the biggest aircraft manufacturer and it's the biggest engine manufacturer. I, I did not want to spell out the names because I wanted, if you go into their annual reports for you to see as well, if there are some further explanations to the numbers that they would want you to take um, into account. But certainly here you can see that the order intake uh, for the aircraft manufacturer dropped with some 75%. The deliveries dropped with uh, 35 and the revenues with 40% or 37.5. And the engine manufacturer is showing almost more or less the same. And as these are the giants, uh, this is, I think, a good indicator of uh, the overall uh, situation in the industry as a whole. So this is what the industry is experiencing for the time being. Um, on the defense side, uh, there is no good uh, numbers for the time being. So here you can see the defense expenditure uh, as a percentage of total governmental expenditure over a number of years. So from 2001 to 2016, which is all pre-COVID. Uh, basically, I have nothing to show in terms of, of uh, how COVID has impacted. We thought COVID would impact the defense industry heavily. But it seems that uh, two things has happened. One is a number of, of states has uh, put forward uh, def defense procurements to help the aeronautical industry. And also the geopolitical situation has in increased and rapidly uh, has, has uh, decreased in stability, if I may say so, and increased in, on the demand side. So rapidly, there has been also timelines put forward on the defense side. So we don't see a drop in the defense right now, but I wanted to show you this slide anyway, because there is a significant marker on the slide on 2008 when we had the financial crisis. You can see that after that, the defense pillars are dropping. And what we fear now is that when member states would come into the full cost of the recovery of COVID, that the defense sector again becomes a budget a regulator, which could then, of course, impact defense uh, procurements for the future. So uh, looking ahead, what are we looking at? The twin transition is indeed a theme and also the geopolitical threats that are increasingly uh, developing in a bad direction is obviously a couple of drivers for this sector. Um, we believe, first of all, that the COVID crisis has indeed uh, only accelerated the need for the twin transition. So it's not about a new need. It's not about delaying anything. It's not about trying uh, to, to, uh, to handle this over a greater period of time. On the contrary, what the European industry is trying to do is to turn this from a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge, but to turn it from a threat to an opportunity. We want to be the leading industry in the world on going green. Uh, and our way to do so has been spelled out in what is called Destination 2050. So I'll show you a couple of slides on Destination 2050. But this is a, a report, it's a document that is well worth reading for the one who wants to understand what is the focus for the aeronautical industry. And uh, of course, the geopolitical development imposes also new and raising security threats that would have to be taken into account and is already taken into account by a number of member states. And from that, we expect that there will be a higher interest for investments in the cybersecurity sector, in the space sector, and in the defense and security sectors, generally speaking. So, sorry. Um, this is uh, then uh, the first slide on the destination 2050. What is this then? This is the industry route to net zero European aviation. So we believe that we can achieve net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2050. And the ones behind this, so it's a combined effort of the airlines, the airports, the, uh, the manufacturers, the service providers, all working together. And this uh, has re resulted in after a year and a half, uh, full, uh, fully fledged report about exactly what needs to be done, 
what timelines, uh, how to do it, etc. And this is what we're pushing forward towards the Commission, towards national member states, towards uh, the, the global community, uh, all saying that industry is prepared to do its role, but we need governmental support and we need uh, EU support to get there. The challenges are simply too big for industry to handle alone. And there is a, here's a, a slide that shows you the different, um, where the impacts would be coming from. So how much can actually be, uh, in terms of decarbonization, how much can be improved by technology related to, to kerosene, how much can be uh, related to improved technology when it comes to using hydrogen, uh, sustainable aviation fuels, et cetera, et cetera. So it's only to, to show that when we say we can come down to zero emissions, uh, we also indicate which areas uh, are active in doing so. And that's another slide on the same topic for time reasons. I will spare you with that one. Um, on, the, on the defense side, I think it's important to keep in mind as well that, uh, I mean, for a century, we had three domains uh, on defense. We had land, we had air, we had sea. And now we have two newcomers that has come in only five years. Cyber and space has established themselves as players on the military domains on the defense side. And the threats here can only be tackled by the state of the art uh, technology, which means massive invest investments in research and in innovation. And this is what we call for from the European Union as well. And space is indeed, uh, has moved to become, it's a key enabler for, for uh, services for the aeronautical industry. It's a key enabler for defense capabilities. So it is an extremely important component. And the European Defense Fund is the first time ever we see the European Commission. Uh, becoming not just a regulator, but also a customer investing money into the sector it has never happened before. So this is a milestone. It's a game changer. And now it's supposed to act as a catalyst for, uh, for cooperative projects. Remains to be seen uh, the effect of it, but certainly we are fully supportive of that um, uh, direction. I wanted uh, lastly to just let you know as well that uh, as aviation is a global business, there is obviously a global regulatory body for safety uh, of, the, uh, of the aviation sector, mostly safety and environmental standards, but this is ICAO. And ICAO speaks to the manufacturing industry through a global manufacturing association called uh, ICCAIA, so that's a difficult acronym. But anyway, you have the European industry, the Americans, you have the uh, Canadians, the Brazilians, the Japanese, the Russians on board. We have a number of uh, observer associations. And as we speak, the Chinese are knocking on the door as well. And the three key messages at a KO level where industry need uh, support at the global level is about regulatory measurements. So it's to enable the best use of already existing technologies which are there in the aircraft and would allow an aircraft to enter into an airspace at a given time with a very high accuracy, meaning you don't have to circle around airports in order to wait to land. All of that could be history if we had a modernized ATM system, but the ATM system is the problem today. So this is one of the areas which is key for us. The second area is obviously the industrialization of sustainable alternative fuels, so SUFs. Um, and here, uh, the, the challenges are two. SUF today is three to five, four times uh, more expensive than traditional fuels, and the, the production rates are far too low to, uh, to make any impact on global emissions. However, speaking to the producers, there is a livestock, there could be production if there was a demand side. So we need uh, governments and we need uh, international regulation to drive the, the, the demand side in order to get this move in a changing direction. And the last one, of course, there's a lot of uh, advanced technologies and new energies that we need to get uh, deployed as well. So it's a lot about electrification of aircraft for short range, it's hybrid aircraft, it's hydrogen aircraft. All of that needs to be uh, dealt with from a regulatory perspective as well as from a research perspective. And uh, it's not just an aircraft or vehicle perspective. There is airport compatibility, performance, ATM, et cetera, et cetera. So um, these are also the key issues at the uh, international level. So summing up, uh, I'd say that uh, the most important message, message I have now is that European industry intends to become a leader in decarbonization. We intend to be 
uh, the green uh, continent before anybody else reaches that. And we push heavily to get the, the support from the European institution and the member states and uh, the global community to be able to achieve it. But um, uh, 2019 levels is not a good mark for whether we are back to normal or not. We need, we need other measures for that. So thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Jan. Uh, appreciate that very much. Very uh, enlightening presentation and certainly a lot of extra references of reading for the future strategy of the industry, which will be important for all of our uh, members. Um, I know certainly as one executive who spent the last 10 years in most airports and traveling all over, I think there's going to be a change in that too. So when we talk about back to normal, it'll be interesting to see how business travel is a affected by some of the new opportunities we have for online meetings and perhaps lower business travel. I don't know. Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, and so I've turned to the Q&A uh, part. The, the questions have been coming in. There's one or two that came in uh, through the Q&A chat. Um, they've been answered through the chat function, but I don't know whether Peter wants to just comment. Um, there was a couple of uh, questions on Euro 7 and also uh, a question about the scale of electricity production that's going to be required to achieve zero emissions uh, through the automotive sector. So maybe um, uh, Peter will uh, perhaps just add another comment on those and we'll see whether any other questions come in, uh, particularly on the aerospace sector. So Peter. Yeah, uh, okay, everything is in chat, but in, in essence, of course, Euro 7, nightmare for our industry, uh, and uh, no, nobody knows what will, will come out uh, from the negotiations within within the Commission. But, uh, you know, uh, in, in principle, we, we are all discussing the, the, the CO2 regulation, which is probably the most demanding, but uh, Euro 7 could represent some kind of uh, even much stricter requirement that in principle will kill the combustion engine uh, in, in coming years. Uh, there are thoughts that it should be applicable already as from 2025 and especially for, for certain sectors it will not be possible or economically feasible uh, to, to produce the combustion engines uh, for, for especially smaller segments. So this, this, is, this is a huge, uh, huge question mark for our industry and we will see uh, what, what, what the final proposal from the Commission will be. Uh, but there are tendencies uh, to do that. Uh, with respect to electricity, yes, this is another huge bunch of questions uh, that is uh, going across across industries. Um, I, I think that's uh, you know coming from a country where where we do expect uh, nuclear power plants as as a clean source of energy. Uh, I think pr production of electricity is not a problem, but of course the key issue is distribution, and this is something that uh, I, I think that uh, of course it is layer number three. But at a certain point of time, will be will be layer number one because uh, I think we are all following uh, the, the issues uh, with renewable uh, energy and their distribution in time and in in uh, in place, and that is absolutely critical. Of course, having in mind uh, that uh, we need to uh, refocus on a very specific needs uh, for, for the transport sector, uh, that that be really a challenge. I, I think that the decarbonisation of resources is one element. That is doable. It is in principle concentrated. Uh, you, you can you, you can do that. Uh, but uh, how to distribute the clean energy uh, to the final users across Europe? That is something that really uh, needs uh, some some thoughts. And of course, we do not have a magic solution, but it's really something that everyone should think about uh, how to distribute the clean energy uh, to to the final customers. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, we don't have any more open questions coming in through the chant function, but we will be sharing the presentation. The presentation has been recorded and there was a lot of information, a lot of charts, a lot of tables, which I'm sure you may want to find out a little bit more. And uh, I'm sure Anto won't mind me saying that if there are any follow up questions or information required as a result of this uh, uh, webinar, do contact Sesimo. And, and, and Anto will be able to uh, do his best to direct them and get the kind of answers or, or, or appropriate answers to your questions. So that brings us, we're a little bit over time. I'd like to thank everybody for participating and joining uh, the webinar. I'd like to thank Anto for organizing and his presentation. And in particular, thank uh, Peter and Jan for providing the insights into the automotive and aerospace sectors, which I found fascinating. And we appreciate you spending the time with us to put that information together. 
So on behalf of Sesimo, I'd like to thank, so thank you and uh, wish you all the very best. Thank you very much.